so that's the first thing it's absolutely fine to look for information but you have to be aware that um, nothing that you read online will definitely apply to your pet um, the only and, and it definitely can't substitute a visit with your veterinarian for an accurate history a full examination as well as any tests that need to be run i'm really excited to introduce you to molly and her owner bex today as they kindly let me tell their story and really it has some key learnings that we can all take away but before i get into that here's the intro Welcome to Call the Vet, the show that answers all your dog and cat questions so they can live healthier, happier lives. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 44th episode of the Call the Vet podcast. So if we've not met before, I'm Dr. Alex and I'm the veterinarian behind Our Pets Health com where my aim is to give you the information that you need to look after your pet to the best of your ability so that you and they can live a healthier happier life so if that sounds like something that you are interested in then make sure you hit that subscribe button um, so you don't miss out on all of my future episodes and if you don't know already as well you can also submit your question to be answered in an upcoming episode simply by heading over to call the vet Dot org. Fill in the form and hopefully I'll be answering your question on an upcoming episode. But really, that's it from me with the intro to this show. Let's get into Molly and Bex's story. And really, the story begins with a question that Bex asked me over on my YouTube channel. She said, um, I was just wondering if you're able to offer any advice. I've been out most of the day today with my three-year-old lab, Molly. Um, she's been doing her usual scent marking. But then I noticed as she stopped and stooped to pee or mark, but stayed there for much longer than usual. And then when we got home, we noticed that after a short while, there was pee on her bed. We thought perhaps she might have just got overexcited. But then just now she's been lying on my bed sleeping and she suddenly jumped up and digs at her bed on the floor. She stoops and she pees a little on it, which is very, very unusual behaviour for her. as She's never had accidents and she's always very good at letting us know when she wants to go out. So Bex finishes by saying that she thinks um, it'll be best to have her checked out at the vets tomorrow, but it's very late at the moment. And she's just wondering if I had any advice or tips that could be useful. Otherwise, Molly seems fine in herself as far as Bex can tell. So to that I replied that it sounds very much like she has a cystitis which is most likely due to a bladder infection in dogs. Now if you've got a cat actually cystitis normally isn't due to an infection but that is a topic and a question for another day. Um, I then say there can be other causes though that are not so common Um, and an example was that that last week I saw a dog whose bladder was absolutely chock-a-block full of stones Um, and then I suggest that if you can take a urine sample with you um, so Bex takes a urine sample with her when she goes to the vet then that would also be really really helpful um, and that you don't actually have to collect a lot. So one of the great things about urine samples is that actually even a few drops can go, you know, quite a long way with uh, helping with our diagnosis. So after that kind of reply to the initial question, Bex then said that um, she took her today, but actually um, she noticed that Molly was licking her paws and when I inspected it looked infected. So took her down to the vets as mentioned, mentioned about both issues. It turns out there was an infected cut and also the vet did an ultrasound and said that it does look to be a case of a UTI, so a urinary tract infection, a a bladder infection or cystitis as well. So um, Molly was put on anti-inflammatories and antibiotics as well as a gel for the cut. Um, And to that, I said, great, at least you've ruled out stones, which which would have been even more expensive. Well, unfortunately, there is a little bit of an expense, as you'll find out with Molly. But um, and then I go, I'm sure she'll be sure sure she'll be back to normal soon, which is probably the kiss of death. Um, Bex then said, yeah, absolutely. Thankfully, I have insurance. So um, a claim goes through and it'll be OK because she'll be paying much less. I think her UTI is clearing up as she hasn't been trying to go for a pee inside. Fingers crossed. Thanks for your advice. Truly appreciate it. So, you know, this is then an example of how actually insurance is really good because, it, you know, an ultrasound, I guess it's not something that we will necessarily always or often do in the first case of a cystitis um, but it does allow us to rule out bladder stones which is really important and 
with insurance being uh, being in place here for Bex and Molly, it means that there's no kind of concern about the cost that that might uh, m- might kind of build up unnecessarily, if you like. So it gives really great peace of mind, and there's great benefit to having that insurance in place, as we'll kind of come on to. So in ninety nine. of cases, that would have been it with Molly. There'd have been no follow-up. Everything would have sorted itself out. Cystitis is by far and away the most common cause of everything that was going on. And the tests that um, Molly's vet ran kind of only confirmed that. Um, But then Bex got in touch again. Um, So she went over to um, ourpetshealth.com and filled out the contact form there and said, Hi, Dr. Alex, my three-year-old lab, Molly, who was diagnosed with the UTI, um, after changing to enrofloxacin antibiotics, she seems to be much better, back to her happy self. She is, however, still occasionally lifting her tail and groaning like she's straining. And then the message was cut off. And I know my contact form, um, it, it does do that from time to time. And it's a bit of a pain. I'm actually I'm going to be making changes to that. So if you do have a question, um, just head over to callthevet.org and fill in that form. Uh, I'm going to be yeah updating that. So it asks you a few more questions just about age and breed. And it's much easier for you to kind of put a longer question in there as well. So if you've been put off in the past by the format, you know, make sure you head over to callthevet.org and submit your question. But anyway, um, I just said, please, the enrofloxacin has made a difference. Um, it looks like the end of your question was cut off though is there anything else you'd like to add now a day or so later I think it was um, Bex then replied and says I do have a bit of an update she started having accidents again and has been getting a discharge I took her to the vets again today Um, he said it's time to get her to a specialist um, where she was referred initially for an MRI but then um, the, the specialist spoke to her and listened to everything that she had to say got Molly calmed down as well as she's quite nervous with new people and said he didn't think that MRI would be best and they'd just do another ultrasound themselves and also some blood work and she'd have to stay over. Bex then got home and then was contacted again by the specialist who said that they believe she has a bit of a build-up of mucus in her uterus. Um, So previously she had a keyhole space so she was spayed uh, but only her ovaries were taken and there's nothing inherently wrong um, with that because that does prevent pyometra it does reduce the mammary tumor risks um it does you know have a massive impact of kind of impacting all of the benefits that we get from a spay so um you know a lot of people are now taking just the ovaries rather than doing a full ovario hysterectomy um but that's again by the by so the uterus was distended um and he said that he think that that could be causing um the problems with um the weeing the accidents in the house and the strange tail lifting behavior And so with all that, the specialist said, actually, it's probably good news so far, and hopefully they'll be able to find out what the problem is. But unfortunately, it's not going to be solved with medication alone, and she'll need surgery to remove the problem. Um, Bex couldn't remember what he called it. It sounded a bit like pyometra, um, but different. And while it wasn't an absolute emergency to operate then and there, he wanted to get it done sooner rather than later. So clearly it's causing problems and it's not something that we just want to sit and, you know, let develop and cause, you know, more discomfort or distress um, to poor wee Molly. So, you know, she was due to have surgery um, the following day so um you know bex was then just wondering if i had any more information about what it could have been how it could have happened as she's only three um so from there i replied well you know i was really sorry to hear that and it sounds like you know molly was going through a bit of a bumpy road and bex of course because it is a big stressor for for us as pet owners for you as you know carers for your pet when they do become unwell and then I said that if it was a mucometra, so that's where you get a lot of mucus building up within the, the uterus. So it's not an infection. That's a pyometra is an infection where it becomes full of pus. It's all bacteria. It can release a lot of toxins um, and ultimately is fatal if left untreated. A mucometra is a buildup of sterile mucus. So there's not an infection going on, although clearly it was causing um, problems with poor Molly. Um, and I said, well, then surgery should be relatively straightforward. Um, it involves a hysterectomy I mean it should be curative as well so there shouldn't be any ongoing need for any treatment medication any follow-up so that's all really good news as well especially compared to some of the the other potential possibilities now um, as far as I'm aware we don't really know for certain why a mucometra occurs it's it's one of those things it's really not very common 
at all. Um, I mean, occasionally when we spay an older dog, so they haven't been spayed for whatever reason early on in life, when we spay an older dog, we'll sometimes get a little bit of um, kind of mucoid fluid within the uterus, but it doesn't really build up. And I don't think that in itself causes any problems. Um, you know, it may be that after the surgery, uh, things are, are more apparent. There's a problem within the uterine wall, for example. Um, and then I sign off by saying, I hope surgery goes well. Um, and I'll keep my fingers crossed that the recovery is speedy to which Bex thankfully then replied that surgery went very smoothly um, they looked to see if there was any ovary tissue that had been left but couldn't see any which is great um, and you wouldn't, wouldn't expect that it's really very un, unusual to get remaining uh, ovarian tissue left behind after being spayed but it's definitely a possibility and um, we should always be checking for for things like that especially while we're at surgery anyway um, so they took a little extra from the area just to be on the safe side um, and as suspected the uterus was filled with mucus but what they also found was that the passageway from the uterus was abnormally narrow I um, mean he described it basically like a hymen and there was so um, you know and as a result of that the mucus was building up in there um, so you know it wasn't a completely straightforward surgery but you know it went very smoothly Molly recovered very very well um, and kind of at the time of writing she was doing very well now if you're interested in what Molly looks like and there's some great pictures of you know kind of what the initial um, problem was but also Molly in her recovery um, head over to the show notes she's a super cute um, Labrador and yeah definitely head over to the show notes and check those out um, which Bex kindly sent for me so that's really Molly's story but why I'm telling you all of this and why I think thought it was a great story to share is that there really are some very important lessons here for, for all of us as pet owners, but also, you know, as veterinarians as well. Uh, the first lesson is that looking for information online um you know is absolutely fine we all do that regardless of um you know what the problem is whether it's a problem with your plumbing with your car with your garden whatever it is we always look for information online if there is a problem but bex knew full well that a vet visit was needed so she was looking for maybe a little bit of reassurance or a, a, a tips and i was able to say well you know taking a urine sample would definitely help but there's no way that i could diagnose that even though everything sounded like a, a cystitis so that's the first thing it's absolutely fine to look for information but you have to be aware that um, nothing that you read online will definitely apply to your pet um, the only and, and it definitely can't substitute a visit with your veterinarian for an accurate history a full examination as well as any tests that need to be run so if anyone is giving you definitive answers online to me that's a bit of a red flag because they can't possibly know exactly what's going on they've not um, spoken to you they've not taken a full history and they've not examined your dog or your cat either so you know that's the first lesson and Bex you know did a great job there she knew that that um, yeah knew that that was needed. Now, the next lesson is not ignoring the fact that if the treatment hasn't worked as well as expected, just taking that as, as something that you can't do much about. So seeking additional help early rather than waiting until your pet is really sick again or going to a different um, vet just because things haven't gone to plan first time. So very often we, um, you know, we'll, we'll uh, give a presumptive treatment, if you like, without running tests, especially if conditions seem relatively straightforward. Certainly in this case, it might have come back that with a urine sample, there was signs of a bit of inflammation. There might have been a bit of blood. There might have been some bacteria. And that could have just come actually from the uterus rather than the bladder, but it was expressed in the urine that was collected. And so quite rightly, uh, you know, you know, your dog would have been treated for a cystitis with that. But, you know, things were more complicated than that. But Bex did a great job. She didn't just think, oh, well, the antibiotics have helped a little bit. Um, I'm just going to sit on it for another few weeks. No, she was like, no, it's it's not quite right. She's not back to normal. She's starting to, to get the problem developing again. And so she went back to her vet and sought additional help. And then the vet did a fantastic job, did a few more tests and thought, no, we need to take things and ne an the next step and go for a referral. And this brings us to the kind of the third lesson for the day. And that is that common things occur commonly. So if 99.9% .9 of cases that prevent like that present, sorry, like Molly did, um, have cystitis, then absolutely it's it's a great thing to do to assume that that's cystitis. But if we kind of are saying, if we hear hooves, sometimes it's zebras rather than horses, meaning that sometimes these really rare, uncommon things do happen to our pets. And it's 
often a case of just working through the process. So we can treat or we can test for the most common things first. And then if the treatment isn't going to plan or the tests are all coming back as normal and not giving us our answer, we then have to start testing and looking for the the zebras, the uncommon conditions, uh, you know, which typically take more time. The tests are often more expensive, but we need to work through that process. If you're getting frustrated because your vet can't find the answer, Really, it's likely that they're trying their best. They're working through the most common things. It would be all too easy for us to, as, as vets to say, well, we've got this whole long list of potential things that could cause, be causing your pet's problems. Let's run tests that will check on everything. That would cost an absolute fortune, though. And it wouldn't be the right thing to do because in the vast, vast majority of cases, uh, the first test, the test for the most common things would come back as positive. And so we'd be wasting a lot of time, money, and also we'd be doing unnecessary procedures on your pet. So, you know, we really need to bear that in mind and we need to kind of stick with the plan, know when the an additional intervention needs to be made so um, be clear in your mind that if treatment isn't working when do you need to revisit with your vet if your pet starts doing something else is that an indication that you need to be revisiting with your vet sooner rather than later get your questions answered at callthevet.org so those are the big three lessons that we can all take home from Molly and Bex's story. And I'm really grateful to Bex for letting me share this with you and also for sending me through those photos and images that um, are in the show notes. So definitely head over to the show notes. If you've got a question um, like Bex did originally and then following up with, um, you know, I do try my best to get back to you as soon as I can. And I also love to feature them on this show so that we can all help and we can all learn from each other. So if you do have a question that you'd like to ask me, head over to callthevet.org, fill in the form, and I'll be getting back to you very soon. But that's it from me with this episode. Until next time, I'm Dr. Alex. This is Call the Vet. Take care. You've been listening to Call the Vet. Be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode of the show that answers all of your pet questions.